through a certain book or through a series. And so today I was thinking, the Lord is leading me back to basics, to preach something about that topic. Something that all people should know, but to try to present it through a biblical way and try to provide the principles of God's Word and not just pick and choose things, but to give us the meat of God's Word. So that's good. <clears throat> it's good to study the Word of God. So during we did our series on the Ten Commandments, and Lord willing, we'll finish the Ten Commandments today, and then we'll take a break on that for a while until I come back from my vacation and then we'll start having I have a few things left that I want to preach about in the the basics series a few things that I called Christian discipline so we'll talk about that later but today we want to finish with the Ten Commandments so so far we've talked about these five things and then we started talking about how important it is to understand the law, to understand what God wants from us. It's important to understand God's principles. We're not stuck in chains. We're not enslaved. I can say I'm happy that I'm free to preach the gospel. Amen? I'm happy to free, I'm free from the law. I can't imagine being bound by the Jewish law that I have to follow. We don't have to do any of that, but the law helps us to know God's heart, to know what God's values are, what God cherishes. So we studied this a little bit, and the Ten Commandments are like a warning for us. A warning, don't do this, but do this instead, so we can steer clear to warn us to stay on the right way. So, so far we've talked about seven. Who knows the seven that we've talked about so far? Have you memorized them? Sharon, stand up. There's only one God. Don't worship idols. Third, don't take God's name in vain. Fourth, rest on the Sabbath day. Five, honor thy father and mother. Six, don't kill. And seven, don't commit adultery. Adul yeah, adultery. Yeah, I did it. I did it. Seven, right. All right, all right. Good job. I encourage you to know those. Many people don't know the Ten Commandments. And if you ask them, what are the Ten Commandments? Uh, don't kill. Don't steal. Well, you should know that, okay? You should know that, and I encourage you to memorize them and try to use the hand shapes to help you and remember the numbers so you can keep those in mind. Sharon, use those to remember that. So now we can keep going. Number eight. Today we're going to talk about the last three. So we're going to go forward and keep going. Remember... Where are the Ten Commandments found? Where are they from? No. No. From God. They came from God. The Ten Commandments were not from Moses. They were from God. God gave them to Moses. And Moses gave them to the people of Israel. They're, that's an important difference. They're not Moses' commandments. They're God's commandments. So we find them in two places, Exodus and Deuteronomy. 
chapter 5. And we know who gave them because in both places it says, I am the Lord thy God, who hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That means you and I are no longer slaves. We are saved. I believe that and I encourage you to understand the Ten Commandments, to understand God's heart, that He wants us to know His heart and follow His way. Verse 8 is in Exodus chapter 2015, it says, very simply, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not steal. Deuteronomy chapter 5, 19 says the same thing. Neither shalt thou steal. So, you steal. Number 8, I'm going to sign. How do I sign an 8? Picking up things that don't belong to you. Okay? That's stealing. Now, so picking up things that don't belong to you. Don't do that. That's stealing. So now, don't steal. What does that mean? It's not hard to understand. My kids know that. My kids know what this means. When we go in the store, you see something on the shelf, don't take it and put it in your pocket. That's stealing. Right. Very simple, basic meaning. Don't take what isn't yours. Very simple. The Hebrew word means a thief. Don't thieve or steal or take. It's common sense. If it's not yours, leave it. Don't take it. Duh. Of course. But still, I see... I just recently saw an article from the newspaper today or yesterday. The Jacksonville J Jaguars, you know, the football team, the Jaguars, they have one person on the staff who stole over $23 million in credit by stealing credit. Credit card, 23 million, million with an M, million dollars with a credit card. Not a small number, not thousand, million. <coughs> and I know personally, I personally know a pastor who stole about half a million dollars from his church. Why do they still steal? They want to look good. They want to look nice. They want to buy nice clothes so people will be impressed. And it came to almost $600,000, and he's in jail. He was caught and put in jail for a while and then he got out and he's working to pay it back. He lost his wife, his wife left him, he's divorced. The kids have forgiven him but his wife won't because he used his wife's name on lots of papers. He faked her signature. And he's a pastor, a pastor, who stole.
So remember this commandment. Don't take things that aren't yours. Now, okay, Mark, that's the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? I don't think there's any verses in there about stealing. Are there verses in the New Testament about stealing? Oh, yes, there are. Paul is writing, and it seems that Paul is, to Paul that stealing is the, what is the opposite of stealing? Work. Paul says, let him that stole, now who's ever stolen anything before? Come on, admit it. And I admit that I have stolen from Publix grocery store. And I was a Christian. I went to church. I was a leader in the youth group. But I stole food. I stole several things. I would go out and just put it in my pocket and go out. And the manager caught me and almost fired me. Almost fired me. He sat down and talked to me and he said, if I ever catch you doing that again, that's it. You're going to get fired and get arrested. So that scared me. I knew he was watching me from then on. And I never stole again, but stealing, we're all guilty of this, right? And I'll never forget my first time in public. I'll never forget that I stole and lied both. In church, I was sitting there and hearing church and they passed out cookies, Oreos. Now, when I was growing up, we never had Oreos at home. We had some other brand of cookies, but they weren't Oreo brand. So, oh boy, Oreos, that's the best. So, I went up to get my cookie, came back and ate it in secret, and got back in line. And I showed up and held my hand out for a cookie. And they said, I already gave you one. No, you haven't. Yes, I did. I gave you one. No, no. Cross my heart. You didn't give me one. <coughs> Come with me. So we went to the bathroom. And it's like the... You know, it's not like they were going to go to the bathroom. And, and I don't want to leave that kind of impression. But we went in the bathroom. And she held my... And she said, I can see your teeth are black. Come with me. I'm going to go talk to your father. Oh, no, no, no. Well, my father was the music leader in the church. At that time, this was the invitation time. And if, my, if he, his son was up there in front of the invitation, it was big deal. And I was crying, don't tell my dad. Please don't tell my dad. I was just sobbing. But we've all stolen one. I don't know how old I was, maybe 10. I don't know. But we've stolen one. And Paul says, let him that stole, that stole, that used to steal, steal no more. Stop. Stop stealing. Steal no more. But rather, let let, rather than stealing, do what? Let him labor. Hard work. Working with his hands the thing which is good. That he, Why? That he may have not only earn a profit, but he has to give 
to him that needeth. One of the most important financial principles that I can encourage you is not just work to earn money. Work to earn money and also to give generously. That means not just a little bit, but generously to give a lot. We need to give for our own benefit, the opposite of stealing. As a church, we need to be generous. We don't want to be selfish. We don't want to be misers. So which are you? Are you a giver or a taker? Oh, of course here in church we're giving. Of course we are. But what about in the background? I encourage you, don't be selfish. Don't be a taker. Now I admit, I struggle with this. I grew up without a lot of money. And I saw money as something to hang on to. And I didn't want to give it away. But it's all right. We sh it's wise. We need to give wisely, of course. Don't become so stingy and selfish that you neglect people in need. But I encourage you to be a giver instead of a taker. So that's number eight. What is it? Don't steal. Don't steal. Don't pick up things that aren't yours. Do you understand that now? That's stealing. Are you picking up things secretly and with nobody? I'm not talking about finding. I'm talking about stealing. Don't steal. If you see somebody drop something and you take it without letting them know that's stealing. But if you find it and nobody's around, you could give it to the church, you could give it to the lost and found. If you know a place, for example, in my family recently, I went to a place with Christmas lights and we went to a big, there's a big Christmas tree and they You know, they have a place where you can take pictures. And somebody had left something. And I put it in the lost and found. And I let them know. This was left there. I don't want anybody else to steal it. So better to take it to the lost and found. I don't know whether people ever came back for it. If I lost something, I would want somebody to put it in lost and found so I could go back and, and go look for it. I hope it's there in the lost and found. And if it's not there, I'm disappointed, you know. So we should not steal. Don't, don't pick up things that aren't yours. Number nine. Verse nine. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy, thy neighbor.
So I'm going to spell neighbor for now. We'll talk about what the word means later. Deuteronomy 5.20 Neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor. Okay. So how would you sign this? Lying with the nine hand sign and gossip. Don't. Lie and gossip. Don't. So why are we talking about lying and gossip both? First, let me explain <coughs> what bear means. It's not an animal. To bear false witness. What does that mean? <coughs> it seems to be a court situation. The ancient Jews didn't have a court system like we have. They went through the tabernacle or through the Levites. If there was a dispute, they would take the problem and go to the tabernacle or the Levites. And if someone said something that wasn't true to win the case or the argument, what was that called? Lying. It's a lie. A witness, to witness means to bear testimony or a record. So why is it bad to spread false report? Because lies hurt people. Oh, it's just a little white lie. It won't hurt anything. Be careful. There's no such thing as a white lie. There's white chocolate. There's no such thing as a white lie. Only dark lies. Like dark chocolate. No. All lies are sin. Now, they are different. And I explained to my kids there's a difference between surprise and lies. For example, if I keep something quiet because I want to surprise someone, that's all right. If I already know and plan to tell them the truth, but I'm keeping it hidden for, you know, three, three months or so, and I have to keep it a secret, that's different. But when we talk about lying, we mean to hurt other people. So what about the New Testament? Are there verses about lying in the New Testament? Let's see. Oh, look. Ephesians. Again. We just talked about Ephesians chapter 4. Now here we are again. And ye that put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and in true holiness, put a way what it says <coughs> putting putting away what ah. lying Ooh. speak every man truth with his neighbor <coughs> for we are members one of another now notice that i'm spelling neighbor not signing it as neighbor. The word doesn't really mean someone who lives next to you. It means someone who is close to you. An associate. Could be close to you, could be a little bit further away. There's a famous story about who your neighbor is. Remember that? The Samaritan, 
who saw a Jewish man lying in the road and went to him and helped him and picked him up and took care of him. And who ignored him? A Jewish priest ignored him. And a Levite ignored him. Two people who are supposed to be working for the Lord ignored him. The Samaritan was not even the same family. He lived far away from him and they never mingled. And Jews, the Jews and Samaritans hated each other. But the Samaritans saw him and was willing to help him. And we should do the same. And not lie. But instead, we should stop lying. <coughs> right? Anybody ever lied before? <laughs> right? We lie. So stop lying. And I tell my kids, if I catch you lying, what's your name? And they say, oh, JL, or whatever the name is. Last week I did this with my son, Ethan. He's not three years old yet. I'm already training him. Ethan. And he knows he's in trouble when I come to him and I say, Ethan. Oh, and he starts protecting his rear. He knows... Ethan, what's your name? And he won't say anything. He just signs like this, Ethan, he won't talk to me. Ethan, right, that's your name. What's your last name? I don't know. I've taught my kids their last name. Truett. Remember the true? We tell the truth. We don't tell lies. That's what your name means. Truth. I really emphasize this. We tell the truth. As Christians, we have a responsibility to tell the truth. So gossip is another way that we bear false witness or lie. Oh, Mark, no, I only share what's true. If I hear, first I check it out and make sure that it's true. And if it's true, then I start spreading it. It's all right to gossip if it's true. No, it's not. In Romans chapter 1, 29, it says, being filled with all unrighteousness. And then there's a famous list of sins. And one of those sins is being, of being filled with all unrighteousness. <coughs> Along with fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, being full of envy, murder, debate, Deceit, malignity, and then whisperers. Those who gossip. I'm just sharing. I'm not gossiping. I'm just sharing. I've seen that before. Sharing the news, that's all. Be careful. Be careful. And understand gossip becomes gossip in two ways. This is important to understand. Gossip is always focused on negatives. 
I've never heard people say, hey, did you see Bill yesterday? Did you see his shoes? They are so cute. Shh. Just keep it between the two of us. His shoes are so precious. I like his shoes. Don't tell him. Don't tell him, okay? I've never seen that before. Never seen that before. Gossip is always negative. Now, big shoes are ugly. Why did he show up in church with those kind of shoes? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm not even looking at your shoes. I don't even know what kind of shoes you have on. Christine's shoes. No, I'm just kidding. So, gossip is always focused on negative. Always. Did you see that person? Wow. Uh, they are so ugly. Or so dumb. Or so <coughs> terrible. It's a way of judging people. We judge people because it makes us feel better. We put other people down to make us, to build ourselves up. Or to get, become more popular, gain more popularity. And pride, for sure. Gossip is always focused on the negative, and the goal of gossip is what? For other people to look down on that person. That's always the goal of gossip. My mother always said, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all, right? Maybe you can think it. You judge someone, and maybe they really do have a problem, and it's obvious that they have a problem. For example, the other day I was driving in downtown Kansas City, Missouri. And I saw somebody who was just flailing around. <laughs> completely out of it. He had a problem, right? Whether it was mental health or drugs, something was wrong. There was something not right about them. And I could have said, look at that, what an idiot. And, la and laughed and made fun of them. I could have. And that's negative. That is gossip. That is a bad report. Why am I mocking them? What b does it benefit me? Instead, I should, and better, I should say, see, that's the result of sin. That's fine. That's fine. Call it what it is. But don't mock them and laugh, them, laugh at them. But say, yeah, this is, this is not good. Or, you know, sometimes people dress in attention-getting ways on purpose and you see it. And you hate to see it. But what does it benefit me? They're already lost. Instead, use the opportunity to teach that this is the result of a lifestyle that doesn't match with God. Or an opportunity to pray for them. <clears throat> instead of showing hatred and making and belittling them the point is not to belittle them but to use the word to teach but to look down on someone that's not the point so Here's my sign. 
lying, gossip, don't. Lying and gossip, don't. Okay? Number 10. Exodus. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's, again, I'm saying, I'm spelling this, right? Another person who's close to me. whether it's a literal neighbor or not, his wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And Deuteronomy, chapter 5. <laughs> Deuteronomy, chapter 5, verse 21. Neither shalt thou desire, different word here, desire, thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt, thy, shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, or his ox, his, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. So, how are we going to sign the tenth one? Don't want or desire Okay, with the five hand shape, to want or to desire. So what does covet mean? What does the word covet mean? We see this word often. What does the word actually mean? And it's interesting, there are two words in Hebrew that are used in this passage, these two different passages. There's a little bit of difference between them. First is to ha is to desire or lust for. Not just sexual lust, but also materialism. Material lust. And another meaning is to wish for. Now, I'll be honest with you, this one really hits me. How many times have I lit a candle, a birthday candle, and made a wish? And I started thinking, why am I doing that? Now be patient with me. It goes a little bit deeper than that. Be patient with me. Why, when I close my eyes and say, I wish for this. Why do I do that? Why? Because I don't have it. Whatever I'm thinking of, I wish for this or I, I wish for this because I don't have it. Oof. How much time do we waste hoping or wishing and daydreaming or coveting things that we don't have? <coughs> How much is enough? We know what the Old Testament says. Don't covet. Okay. Let's be more specific. I need more specifics. No, you don't want more specifics. Do you really want? Okay, fine. I'll give them to you. You might be mad at me. 1 Timothy chapter 6. But, godliness... Being like God, with content, 
contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. I have more than enough food. I have more than enough clothing. Why do I want more? But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We are sometimes consumed by stuff and materialism. Right now it's Christmas time. Pretty good example. Everybody's gone to see Jesus and the, bab the, the baby in the manger, right? No. What are they going to see? They're going to sales. They're going to flat Black Friday. Come on, let's go shopping. Come on, let's go buy, buy, buy. Support the economy. I encourage my kids, when we go through the store, if you see something you want, look at me and ask me. And I say, do you, have a, do you have enough? And sometimes they cry. I ask them again, do you have enough? Yes, Daddy. We have enough. And sometimes we look to God, and I have to admit it, and I say, God, I have enough. Lord, protect us from covetousness. I'm guilty. I want a bigger church. I want a gym. I want people to come here. Is that coveting? I don't know. But I have to search myself and check on myself. And you say, oh, it's fine. But so I still feel guilty. So I think, and, and it's not bad to dream, to have a vision and a plan and a goal. That's not bad, to have a goal. But just be careful that we don't become so distracted by our own goals. Keep our eyes on Jesus and trust in Him. He will accomplish what He will accomplish and be careful. <coughs> you know, we can't have a ministry without this and this and this. Be careful. Be careful. So, that's number 10. Right? Don't want or covet. So that wraps up the Ten Commandments. Let's make some application in our lives today. So, we know not to steal, right? That's a basic. 
That's pretty basic. Don't steal. We learned that at age three. But we have to remind ourselves still. I do. Maybe you need reminding too. Instead of stealing, work hard. Secondly, don't lie or gossip or give false reports. Don't do that. And don't covet. But instead, be thankful and content. This is an opinion. This is God's word. Don't covet. Be content. Accept what you have and thank God for what you have. It's clear. When was the last time you said thank you to God for what you have? Even if you don't have what you want, still be thankful to God. Thank the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, my house burned down. That's hard to say thank you for your house burning down. Thank you that my friend died. How can you say thank you for your friend dying? How can you be thankful for that? I never said it was easy. But I challenge you to know God's heart. To know his principles. Oh, I wish for this. Or instead, be thankful and satisfied with what you have. I encourage you to do this. If you have enough money for food and clothing, you don't need to buy anything special. Be, have a grateful attitude and contented instead of saying, I want this, I need this, I need to go out buy and buy stuff. And become a consumer who can't have enough. Instead, be thankful for what we have. Let's close with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we th thank you for your blessings. We ask you to take care of us. Your word says that we, you will take care of us. You've never seen the, we've never seen the righteous go without clothing. You know the hair on our heads. You know exactly what we need. You see the sparrows and we are more valuable than them. Lord, we thank you. Take care of my wife and family. Thank you for taking care of the church. I trust in you to keep taking care of us. Bless us and help us remember these things. And your words, your commands. And we say, no, it doesn't mean that. But we know what these words mean. Help us to know and follow your way. Yes, I know we make mistakes. I'm guilty. I've broken all of the commandments. And I thank you for having mercy on me. For having grace. And when you sin, sin no more. Start again. If you're playing in a game and you, it's, you have to go to a save point, I thank you that we can, when we mess up, we can go back to the save point and go back and go back and go back. You don't have to make us go all the way back to the beginning. Help us to stay close to you. In Jesus' name, amen.